Doctors of Reddit, what made you say how, are you still alive? Pathologist here, had a guy who had died suddenly and unexpectedly. I soon learned he was the recipient of a lung transplant about 15 years prior. When I opened the man up, his transplanted lung was upside down. I flipped the lung into the proper position, and bloop. It flipped right back to upside down. That was quite alarming. The surgeons who originally performed the transplant incorrectly attached the organ. When he by chance, entered the correct position, the lung flipped over, causing his pulmonary artery to seal shut, resulting in his death. The man lived for 15 years with a lung, that was dying to flip upside down. And it was only by sheer chance he didn't move in such a way, that allowed it to do so until the fateful day of his death. It is one of the most fascinating cases I have ever witnessed. Not a doctor or anything, but my grandmother has had 7 strokes. I cold and help, but laugh at the 7th one, she said. A WW shoot, I'm having another stroke. She said this during a phone call abruptly. She's a very tough lady, she runs a garden, and eats her in vegetables. A patient I took care of had a cough all on his face. He was underneath it working, when it slid off of the jack. The only reason he survived, was because he broke every bone in his face he had a left or three which allowed for his brain to swell he also needed an additional surgery, to relieve the pressure of cerebral edema, but the facial fractures, did allow for a great deal of give in his skull. I was rotating through IQ, so I first saw him just a day after the accident. His head was so swollen, he didn't even look human. Fast forward a few weeks later. I was rotating through a different unit in the hospital, and came across the same patient. He was quickly recovering, and had minimal neuro deficits. Edit. For patient privacy purposes, I cannot give the age of the patient or location of the accident. I'm also not disclosing, how long ago this was for the same reason. And of course I do not have photos, as for minimal neuro deficits, I saw this patient very briefly a few weeks after the accident. At that time. He still had edema, and was in the process of getting better every day. I use that word in considering the severity of his injuries. He still had progress to make, but was able to walk and talk, had no memory deficits not including immediately after the accident and his time in IQ, of course. I did not follow his care all the way through to discharge, so I don't know what he was like then, or in the months following the accident. I wouldn't be surprised, if he went on to go to college, and is living a normal life. He was a younger patient and younger brains tend to be more plastic, in that they can recover from injuries better than someone who is older. Edit 2, a few people have asked, why they don't break facial bones as a last ditch effort to relieve brain swelling. They do break the skull, just not the facial bones. They can make small holes called their holes, or if the swelling is really bad, they can temporarily remove entire pieces of skull craniotomy. Sometimes pieces of skull are stored in the abdomen to keep them alive, so that they can put them back later. <laughs> Saw a guy with a machete, lodged up into his skull. Asked him if he was okay not sarcastically, just through a generic question. To check his ability to respond, he said yup. Not a doctor, my grandfather had a heart attack. He went in for a simple stent in his heart. Hours go by, and we hear code blow over the intercom. Doctor comes out to tell us his left ventricle has an inch and half tear in it. They had to transport him to another hospital as soon as possible. He died three times that night, and went through 11 pints of blood. The surgeon successfully repaired the torn ventricle. They woke him up on my birthday and he sung me happy birthday. Three weeks in cardiac IQ my grandfather walked out. The surgeon told us for a man of 75 years, to have lived through a left ventricle tear as you n heard of. The doctor wrote a journal on him as well. He's still alive today. He even got his hip replaced a year after. Guy had an argument with his girlfriend, wanted to leave the apartment. Instead of taking the door, was real angry, and jumped off the balcony, fell down 40 feet directly on his heels on cement. He ended up having an ankle sprain. I wondered how he managed previous issues in his life. Had a gentleman in his late 50s come in with multiple myeloma. 
short history of progressively worsening breathlessness, turned out he had a pulmonary embolism blood clot in his lungs. He was a good candidate for surgery, so he had the blood clot removed, but unfortunately the clot had caused such bad issues with his heart acute right heart failure, that he couldn't be weaned off the bypass machine. Instead, he went to IQ on ECMO like a circuit for your heart and lungs outside the body, to give your heart slash lungs time to rest. His chest was still open cannulated centrally, but covered up with sterile stuff. After 3 days, he was booked to be weaned off the ECMO or at least have the tubes put in peripherally so his chest could be closed. Morning of the procedure, while he's waiting to be moved, somehow the tubing of the ECMO machine broke oxygenator tube and blood spilled all over the floor and he went into cardiac arrest. The cardiothoracics consultant had to do internal cardiac massage basically CPR on the heart by squeezing it via his still open chest until the circuit got fixed and he returned to a normal circulation. He ended up going to what and having his chest closed but he had more clots pulled out of his pulmonary arteries clots had recurred. At this point I thought this guy was utterly fricked. I figured if he even lived long enough to be woken up he'd have some degree of ischemic brain injury. After about 2 weeks the guy left IQ and a week later went to rehabilitation. Speaking, walking, cognitively largely intact. It was one of the most unbelievable things I've ever seen during my short career. I was in school to be a paramedic, and I was doing my externship in an hour. A guy came in happily complaining about a sore on his belly that wouldn't heal. He was really pleasant and didn't seem to be in much pain. When he lifted his shirt, we could see his liver. The Imana nurse had a guy walk up to the front desk after hitting himself in the throat with a chainsaw. All the flesh of his neck was flayed off I could see his trachea and his right jugular vein. If he had cut in just a tiny bit deeper, he would have sliced right into both. The only thing that saved him was that he was a big fat guy with a huge neck. A skinnier man would have died very unpleasantly. As a very junior doctor I looked after this mega alcoholic who needed acetate fluid in the abdomen, caused by liver failure tapping out every month or so. He kept coming in a worse and worse shade of yellow green jaundice, needing more and more fluid removed, still merrily drinking all the while. Well, the obvious happened. He died. Now he dead. So I wander onto the ward a few weeks later, to find him sitting there in bed, green as you like, looking very alive. Turned out his was his twin, also an alcoholic, also not to live much longer. Patient stabbed himself in the neck with a thermometer that pierced his trachea. Missed all the important arteries carotids, vertebrals, just hit some minor nerves. Good guy patient, provided his own temperature reads until they removed the thermometer. Guy comes in with a bit of chest pain. Tells me the big coronary artery on the front of the heart was 100% blocked. I tell him who told you that, he says his doctor did about 10 years ago. I don't believe him, since patients never ever get any of the stuff their doctor tells them right. I'll let the cardiac surgeon know what this guy said, and he too goes haha 100%, so has dead, if the biggest coronary artery is totally occluded, and for 10 years no less, you are a dead man. Lo and behold. We get an angiogram and it was freaking 100% occluded. The artery on the back of the heart made a connection with the front of the heart to pick up the slack. It was some lucky shoot. I had a guy with a bowie knife sticking out of his chest. The knife was pulsating. I could literally count his pulse from across the room. Not a doctor, but him a nurse and my story is good too. I had a college student come into the unit on the night of their 19th birthday. They wanted to party, but had a test the next morning. One of their friends told them that, if they took one Adderall for every drink that they had, they'd be sober by the morning. They had 15 shots and 15, 20 milligram Adderall tablets. If you were wondering, no, that does not make you sober. It does, however, make you rip off all your clothes in a hallway, spit at the nurse, that is trying to help you, shoot all over everything, and then literally freaking die. Luckily for them, they weren't dead for good. We got them back, and they spent most of their sophomore year of college in a hospital, with a hole in their neck, learning how to walk again. I have thought that, after seeing some court scans of lungs in severe COPD, it's like there is no normal lung tissue, just huge air pockets. It is hard to see how they exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide at all. 
not a doctor but encountered a woman that was shot blank in the head by her boyfriend. Bullet entered one of her eye sockets and exited above her and ear on the same side. She called Nin one only in her own and survived, was an IQ for weeks, and testified against the bastard who is now thankfully in prison. Not a doctor, but been a paramedic 15 years. Had an 8 year old kid on a ripstick similar to a skateboard lose control, and roll into the path of an oncoming sub in his neighborhood. He was hit by then run over by it. We arrived to find him face down under the vehicle, unconscious, barely breathing. After all was said and done he had, bilateral femur fractures, one lower leg fracture, multiple rib fractures, a blown pupil, and open skull fracture, sutural brain bleed, attention pneumo air escaping lungs into the chest cavity, will squish you lungs and heart if untreated, and when we were bagging him breathing for him, we felt subcutaneous emphysema free air that crackles like rice crispers slash bubble wrap in his hip. Yes hip. We flew him to the children's hospital expecting him to die within the hour. He was in a coma 4 days, and had to have multiple surgeries, but made a complete recovery 100% neurologically intact as well, and graduates high school in the spring. His was such an amazing case the hospital made him one of their miracle kids of the year. Parents please make your kids wear helmets, even in the neighborhood. It wouldn't have prevented all of his injuries, but would have substantially lessened the brain trauma he suffered. They got his age wrong in this year too. B slash 9 QTLDG 5 GL 4. Old guy comes in with his wife. She tells me he passed out last week and I cold and wake him up. After about 2 minutes he came around, and he didn't want to go to the hospital, so we booked an appointment to see you. I'm a little concerned by this, and his heart rate is a little slow, so I send him for an EKG heart rhythm tracing. I get a call about an hour later from the cardiologist reviewing the EKG calmly thanking me for sending him in, because the wiring in his heart essentially wasn't working, and he could drop dead at any moment. Again. Because the week before, he hadn't passed out, he died. Through some lucky miracle his heart started again. Has got a passama canal, and he and his wife are doing just great. Paramedic here, so many but to come to mind. Responded to a well-being check basically check on someone no one has heard from in a while. Get there and police advise the woman is dead, and appeared to be so for a while middle of summer. Can smell her, before getting close to house, put on protective gear and air packs to move the body. She is rotting, maggots and flies, can see organs. We go to carefully move her into body bag and she opens her eyes and gasps. She was alive and rotting alive, we got her to the hospital alive, and she lived for several days more. Second was a suicide, shotgun to the face. He held it under chin, but it slipped, and he blew off front of face except one eye. He was awake, and tried to talk but obviously cold. We ended up sedating and intubating, but he lived and walked out of hospital after tons of reconstructive surgery. Hemoglobin of 35, 3, 5. In a 35 year old guy with a chronic rectal bleed he refused to have looked into for months, because he didn't want anyone looking at his bum hole. Finally brought to the air by ambulance, when he fainted Aka started dying in a grocery store. Not a doctor, but I work in cardiology, and my doctors all do rotations at our hospital. Our hospital is a level 5 trauma and it's the closest hospital to a lot of rural area, so a lot of traumas that happen way out in the middle of nowhere end up at that hospital. This guy came in having been in a car accident, he was covered in road rash and his chest was more or less torn up apparently, as we all later learned, had been drinking and riding passenger in his friend's car. He wanted out of the car, his friend said no, so this guy once again. Very drunk decided to try and jump out of the car window. He somewhat succeeded, but his shirt caught on the side view mirror, and he got dragged, until the driver stopped flipping out enough to come to his senses and stop. My dad's a doctor, so I asked him. When he was an intern in the air, someone walked in the front door with a kitchen knife sticking out between his eyes to the handle. The knife went through his sinus cavity, and ended with a tip in his throat, millimeters from his brainstem. He goes into surgery and walks out of the IQ the next day. My dad says he is the luckiest man he ever saw. A young woman came into emergency complaining about abdominal pains. She looked to be about 5 months pregnant. The nurses got her into a gown and called me. 
Upon entering her room she was laying on her back. I asked if she would mind putting her feet in the stirrups on the table. Then I proceeded with the examination. Using a bright light, saw what looked like a tiny piece of skin way up in her vagina. Getting a pair of forceps, I stood immediately in front of her spread legs and reached up to grasp the piece of skin. It wasn't a piece of skin as it turned out. Getting a firm grip I pulled and nothing happened, so I tried to get a better angle to pull from. Now with both hands, the skin like flap started to move. Then all of a sudden a 5 month old tampon burst out of her along with this huge clot of rancid smelling blood. Having come directly from a meeting with the hospital's board of directors, my brand new dress pants and best dress shoes did a great job of sopping up the brunt of the initial dam overflow. After throwing out all my clothing, showering and putting on hospital scrubs, I inquired as to how the young woman could confuse pregnancy with the lost tampon. Apparently she and her boyfriend would go out drinking alert and always had sex when she was on her period. He somehow had convinced her she was pregnant and they continued to have regular sex. Unfortunately for this pair of individuals I was sorry to tell them that my roster was full and could not take them on as new patients.